Hey, good morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, I'm Pastor Mike Childs, and I am inviting you to worship with me. Um, you could go to the Lakewood United Methodist Church at 10 a.m. and uh, worship, but by now uh, I'm posting this about 11 o'clock, so service there is about done. Um, typically, we would have live stream from both Lakewood and Celeron, uh, 10 o'clock and then 11.15. But uh, I've been on quarantine, and so I am at home until uh, this coming uh, Tuesday, and then, uh, then I'll be back to my outdoor activity, uh, able to go to work and all that. So uh, thank you if you are joining me for worship. This is going to be a, an abbreviated worship service, um, but I welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And glad that you decided to stop and check this out, um, this posting. So uh, we're going to sing some songs. We're going to have some prayer time and, uh, and a message. And I'm going to read the scripture before the message. Uh, and some points to ponder from the Reader's Digest. So uh, hopefully give you an uplifting start to your Sunday morning and to the week uh, coming ahead. Um, I hope that you are blessed through this. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer a brief prayer, and then I'm going to invite you to join me um, in singing together. So um, this, is, uh, the, this is the call to worship prayer. Hear us, O God, for you are the God who hears and cares. Join our humble efforts to worship, to worship you and to praise your glorious presence. Open us, open us to your power and grace, and forgive us our hubris. In God we ask, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, so pray with me. God, we thank you for this day. We come before you in your presence, and we pray that you would anoint um, me with your spirit and anoint my word with your spirit, that uh, your word is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, to cut and divide, even bone from marrow. And we just pray, Lord, that you would bless this service today, uh, anoint all the services, and I pray that you would uh, just touch all the pastors and uh, let their word come forth powerfully. And we thank you, Lord, for this day that you give us to worship and praise your holy name. And we pray it all in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, our opening hymn today is uh, found in the in your red hymn book, and it's pretty familiar. Number seven thirty one, glorious things of thee are spoken. So please join me. things of thee are spoken, Zion city of our God, God whose word cannot be broken, form thee for his own abode, on the rock of ages founded, what can shake thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, Thou mayst smile at all thy foes. See the streams of living water Springing from eternal love. Well supply thy sons and daughters, And all fear of what remove. Who can fade while such a river ever will their thirst assuage? Grace which like the Lord, the giver, never fails from age to age. Round each habitation hovering, see the cloud and fire up. 
appear for a glory and a covering showing that the Lord is near thus deriving from our banner light by night and shade by day safe we feed upon the manna which God gives us when we pray. Blessed inhabitants of Zion, washed in our Redeemer's blood, Jesus, whom our souls rely on, makes us monarchs, priests to God. Us by His great love He raises, rulers over self to reign, and as priests his solemn praises we for thankful offering bring. And this was written by John Newton, 1779, and a Croatian folk song uh, arranged by Franz Joseph Haydn. Uh, Austrian, Austrian song. Isn't that great? I love that. All right. Well, this is our unison prayer this morning, uh, same unison prayer uh, that we, you would have gotten if you had uh, attended service today in Lakewood. O God of peace, who has taught us that in returning and rest we shall be saved, in quietness and trust shall be our strength. By the power of your Holy Spirit, quiet our hearts, we pray, that we may be still and know that you are God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And that is from the Book of Common Prayer. Um, each Sunday we have a time of prayer, and I invite you to uh, consider this time also a time of prayer today. Um, here are some, some prayer uh, needs that we're lifting up, and I invite you to lift them up personally as well. Bishop Mark Webb and family, District Superintendent Reverend Suzanne Block, um, Pastor Mike Childs and my wife Leanne and our family, the Lakewood and Celeron United Methodist Churches, also Olean, Trinity and Rivers Edge United Methodist Churches, Pastor Dawn Quesenberry and her husband Michael and their family. And I know Pastor Dawn very well. She's a really neat lady, a good pastor, really cares for her people. Uh, we have some birthdays this week. Colton Capolino on the 19th and Gail Frank on the 20th. And uh, we're remembering Gail Frank in particular. We're also praying for Ellen Maternowski, Rita Weiler, Helen Sperry, Woody Durnell, Sandy Dubois, Don Colsty, Raymond Thorpe, Deb Sperry Confer, Valerie Marsh, Rod Colsty, Laura Thorpe, and Cassandra Foster. And if you do have a prayer concern or prayer request you would like to lift up, you can call the church office, 763-9345, um, anytime, and leave a message on the machine. Um, so we always turn our hearts and our thoughts to God in prayer. Prayer, I think, is one of the most critical things that we do as Christians. It not only dictates... Um, our kind of the rhythm of our life and our spiritual life, but it, it helps us as as people of faith to be strong and to be strengthened and to pray for one another for strength and to praise God. Um, I know the one of the one of the acronyms that are used uh, for prayer: adoration, confession, um, a, a C T S, adoration, confession. Um, can't think of what the T is. And supplication is the last one. Uh, adoration, confession, thanksgiving 
That's what it is, thanksgiving and supplication. And you can use that as a model, okay? Adoration, showing praise to God. Confession, confessing our, our faults, our sins. Um, thanksgiving, giving thanks for all that God blesses us with. And supplication is really this part of asking uh, God for help or asking Him for support, asking for others uh, to have strength and healing. Um, and, it, you know, it's the fourth one for a reason. We, we start with adoration, we end with supplication. So um, pray with me if you would. Pray with me today. Oh God of heaven and earth, we thank you for this day. We thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for being a powerful God who is alive and active in the world today. And often through your servants and through uh, the Holy Spirit, and through your angel, your angelic ministries, uh, we thank you for all of that. We praise you and lift up your holy name today. We adore you. We praise you. We um, love you, God, and we know how you love us. And that feels so good to be in your presence today and to feel your support and to feel uh, your closeness to us. Um, so good to be in your presence and to spend time with you. Uh, you know, Lord, that we are thankful for everything you have given to us. Every uh, thing that comes from your hand is, is a good and perfect gift and a blessing to us. We are uh, such blessed people in this nation. Uh, even the poorest among us is wealthier than some of the uh, poor people in other countries. And God, we are so blessed. Help us to recognize that blessedness and to thank you for it, uh, to give you credit where credit is due, uh, that we cannot, you know, count anything as our own. We are only stewards of it for now, for a short time. And when we are called home, Lord, all that you have given us will remain here, except for our very soul and spirit. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would bless and anoint us today with your spirit. Help us to love you better, to be uh, more faithful, more holy, uh, more directed by your love and your guidance. God, we are, we are sorry for the sins that we have committed this past week by omission or commission. We pray that you would forgive us our sins and lead us into the path of life everlasting. We lift up these people. Uh, we, we think of... Bishop Mark Webb, and pray that he would be strong uh, in these days. Reverend Suzanne Block, give her wisdom to guide and lead us. Uh, for the churches, all the churches, Lord, that your hand would raise them up and make them strong and bring people to support them. Oh God, we pray for Olean, Trinity, and River's Edge churches. We pray that you would anoint them mightily this day. And that your spirit would be powerful on Pastor Dawn. Uh, Lady Q, I call her. I pray that she and Michael would be strong and would be good leaders and, and powerful. I pray for those on our, our list that need special prayer. We think of Rita and Ellen. Think of Helen and Woody and Sandy and Don. Raymond and Laura and Cassandra. We also lift up Colton and Gail especially today. Lord, I pray for them all. Pray for your holy anointing upon them. Bring healing where healing is needed. Uh, bring miraculous healing so that you would strengthen their testimonies. And bring comfort where it's needed. There are those uh, who have lost loved ones. They need comfort and to know that you are close by. God, we love you. We thank you for hearing our prayers and for answering in your time and in your way. And now we join our voices and our hearts and our spirits as we pray that prayer as you taught your disciples. As we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, I thank you if you join me in that prayer. Those are powerful prayers, and they help us uh, day by day. They do help us. Um, we're going to sing another song. I'm going to do three songs this Sunday. Jesu, Jesu, it's number 432 in your Methodist hymn book. 432. Um, and it may be unfamiliar, but I think you'll like it. It's called Jesu, Jesu. Might be new to you. Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Kneels at the feet of his friends, silently washes their feet. Master who acts as a slave to them. Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Neighbors are rich and poor. Neighbors are black and white. Neighbors are near and far away. Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. These are the ones we should serve. These are the ones we should love. All these are neighbors to us and you. Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Loving puts us on our knees. Serving as though we are slaves, this is the way we should live with you. Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love, show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Kneel at the feet of our friends, silently washing their feet. This is the way we should live with you. Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Amen. Here are some points to ponder uh, from the Reader's Digest, not current, but these are older ones. Diane von Furstenberg, fashion designer, in her memoir, I have been in love many times, but I know now that being in love does not always mean you know how to love. Now, that's one to think about for a while. Yeah, we need to learn how to love. Uh, thinking about that last song about washing the feet and being a ser servant or a slave uh, and an example. Jesus was an example to us. But have you ever seen that show, My Feet Are Killing Me? It's a, it's a fairly new show and the people sometimes have serious problems with their feet. And just to imagine, you know, I, some people are embarrassed by their feet or by their toenails or whatever. Um, and yet Christ lovingly is willing to, to kneel down and wash your feet, no matter how bad they are. No matter the smell, he will wash your feet because he loves you. That's important. Emma Watson, an actress in a speech at the United Nations headquarters, this is what she said. Both men and women should be, feel free to be sensitive. Both men and women should feel free to be strong. It is time that we all perceive gender on a spectrum, not as two opposing sets of ideals. 
and Emma, you probably know her from uh, Harry Potter. She was uh, Hermione. And this is David Burge, a writer in the book, The Seven Deadly Virtues. And he says this, sustaining hope benefits not only you, but everyone around you, even those hopeless, eye-rolling cynics who remain immune to your good cheer. Um, and you know what the Bible says, that we should always be prepared to explain the hope that we have uh, in Christ. So our, our text today comes out of Matthew, and I'm reading today out of the uh, Revised Standard Version, which is a, kind of an older version of Scripture. But to, we're reading Matthew 22, Matthew chapter 22, found on page 23 in the New Testament, and it's 15 through 22, the verses 15 through 22. And here's what the Word of God says. Then the Pharisees went and took counsel how to entangle him, talking about Jesus, in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and care for no man, for you do not regard the position of men. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the money for the tax. And they brought him a coin. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? He held up the coin. They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Render, therefore, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him, and they went away. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, the message title today is A Tale of Two Sides. A Tale of Two Sides. Uh, would you pray with me before uh, the message? God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh God, you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Ad hominem. Ad hominem, maybe you've heard of this. Uh, the definition is as an adjective, an, an argument or reaction directed against a person rather than the position they are maintaining. And uh, the reference or the, the example, vicious ad hominem attacks. As an adverb, there's two different definitions. In a way that is directed against a person rather than the position they are maintaining, uh, the example says, these points come from some of our best information sources who realize they'll be attacked ad hominem. And the second example as an adverb, in a way that relates to or is associated with a particular person. So the office was created ad hominem for Fenton. If you watched any of the debate between President Trump and Joe Biden, you may have heard some ad hominem attacks given. It is often used in the schoolyard when we want to damage someone's ego and we cannot say anything against the person of any substance, but we want to throw an insult at them. It is a Latin phrase meaning against the person. Uh, it reminds me of that old ditty that children always sing. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Of course, it's totally untrue, that ditty. Uh, words can and do harm. And sometimes the sting from a well-placed taunt or especially vicious name can last for years. Uh, and I'm sure that you could probably think of and remember some names that you were called. Uh, people who want to hurt you deeply, they throw these at you. Uh, has nothing to do with who you are or your substance. It's them trying to make you feel small is what it really is. Ad hominem attacks. Uh, these past three weeks, we have looked at parables. Um, Jesus used to strike 
the, used these parables to strike home at the leaders who were angry at him. And they wanted his ministry to end sooner rather than later. Each parable had a unique story and it was easy to pick out the particular role that the leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin were playing in the parable. Here's a brief recap for you. The first parable was about two sons. Both were asked by dad to go work in the field. One said yes, but did not go. The other one said no, but then they went and did the work. Um, and obviously in that one, the first category is the scribes and Pharisees. They said yes, but when the time came, they did not follow through. Second parable was of the householder who rented his land, but the tenants did not pay. And actually, they killed the son when he arrived to collect the rent from them. Um, and in that case, the tenants were the leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. Third parable was of the king who had a banquet, and he invited the guests um, but the invited guests did not attend. They, they answered yes at first, but then they didn't show up when the feast was ready. And um, in each of these parables, uh, in that case, the guests were the leaders, were those leaders uh, who had said yes to follow the way of God and to be uh, in relationship with God, to follow the covenant of God. But then when Christ came as the fulfillment of, and, uh, and showed himself, they refused to believe him. They refused to have anything to do with him. Um, so by now, after these three parables, you can imagine the, the leaders were boiling mad at Jesus. They were angry. They were furious. And they had already started plotting, planning, how to get rid of him. How do we get rid of this guy? He's a real pain in the butt. How do we get rid of him? Uh, we should not be surprised that they have now found a way to do this. And today's text reveals their scheme. See, they, they've been listening and watching Jesus, and then they go aside and they start planning, how are we going to trap him? And today's text reveals the scheme. Uh, let's get Jesus to incriminate himself in front of all these witnesses, and he's going to be done. He will be totally done. You know, it was a cunning and beautiful plan, so simple. When Jesus says, you must pay tax to Caesar, he will be discredited before all of his followers. Or, if he says, do not pay tax to Caesar, the Romans will arrest him quickly for teaching against the emperor. And so it seemed to them a foolproof plan to trap Jesus and to get rid of him. You know, get him out of there. William Barclay, uh, who wrote um, commentaries for the common man or woman, shares that at the time there were three taxes people had to pay. Now remember that Roman is an occupying force in the Holy Land, and these people are, are unwillingly subject to Roman rule. So first of all, there was a ground tax on the property you owned or you were working and they paid partly in produce. For example, if you had a wheat field, you would pay one-tenth of the grain you harvested, and then you would uh, also pay something in money. If you had uh, a, a, an olive grove or you had a vineyard, you would pay one-fifth of oil or wine that you, that you got from your harvest, and then you would pay the rest in, in money. Um, Second thing, there was an income tax. We all know about an income tax. 1% of a person's earnings had to be paid to the government. And that would sustain uh, the administration and all of that, the Roman uh, rule. And so 1% of a person's earnings. So if you earn $10, 1% uh, of that would be $1. So for every 10, you gave the government $1. All right. Thirdly, there was a poll tax paid by every male age 14 to 65 and every female age 12 to 65. It was one denarius, and that denarius, um, Jesus called it a tribute coin. Okay, so that one coin you had to pay for the poll tax. And it was worth slightly more than an average day's wage. 
So 365 days in a year. So one 365th had to go as a poll tax just for being a person living at that time. Uh, and of that age. You had to be a certain age. And this is the coin that Jesus was calling for. Bring me the tribute coin and show me the likeness and the inscription on it. Jesus was wise. Now, nobody can deny how smart and wise he was. He knew they were out to get him. He knew what was in their heart as they were plotting and scheming. Who knows, maybe he somehow had heard them talking about it, or maybe he just knew in his heart, um, supernaturally. But it was unusual that the Pharisees and the Herodians would work together because they were not normally agreeable. Uh, Pharisees were working against Rome, while the Herodians supported the position of Herod, the ruler that Rome had placed over the Jewish people. You know, it would be a little bit like the Democrats and Republicans working together to derail Amy Coney Barrett's nomination to the Supreme Court. I don't know if you saw any of that. I watched a little bit of the proceedings of that event, and it was very interesting. Uh, it was as much interesting how she answered as the questions and who was asking the particular questions. That talked talk very loudly about what side they were on and what they were trying to uh, get Amy Coney Barrett to say. They were really trying to trip her up. So Jesus anticipated them. He anticipated them. He knew, uh, you know, their plan. He answered them very wisely. Verse 20, he said, Whose likeness, whose inscription is on this coin? And they said, It's Caesar's. And so Jesus said, Render unto Caesar or give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. The denarius had Caesar's bust stamped upon it, just like our quarter has George Washington on it. Uh, and we all know that phrase, E pluribus unum, you know. Um, so he was saying, basically, you know, if it's got Caesar on it, give it back to Caesar. Uh, so he's talking about the money, uh, the finances, but... Of course, God owns everything. God created everything. So it was a bit of a tricky answer. And it certainly did not, did not compromise Jesus in front of his followers. In fact, it elevated Jesus in front of all the disciples and all the people listening. And it flummoxed those who were trying to get rid of him. But we are all dual citizens, aren't we? We're all dual citizens. Um, we are living here today in the United States of America. And uh, being a citizen gives us privileges. It also gives us an obligation to our nation to pay taxes, to serve when called upon, either on the court or in the military. Uh, and we gain wonderful privileges of living here, enjoying all the benefits our nation has to offer. We have freedom to worship as we want, the ability to, to travel freely except for COVID-19 restrictions, and the ability to live in a democratic republic, uh, the ability to vote in elections, and that's coming up very quickly. And I encourage you, if you're of age, make sure you vote. Um, I do encourage you to vote your heart and your conscience. But besides all of this, we are citizens of heaven. We are citizens of heaven where God is sovereign and God rules completely and there are times when we are called upon to make a decision do we do as God demands or do we do as the nation demands and it becomes uh, an issue of our conscience you know are we listening to God are we following God's way or are we listening to our nation and the way the nation is going and there are critical decisions that we have to make as citizens about what we're going to do. Um, as an example, there were many young men who disagreed with the call to war uh, in Vietnam. And many, uh, you might know someone like that, or maybe you yourself was like that, they felt compelled to be what's called a conscientious objector. In other words, they were objecting to the war 
objecting to fighting in the war, and it was their conscience. So conscientious objector status. Uh, you would have to fight in that particular. You you know you you would say to them, I am against fighting because of this. This is what I believe uh, that it's wrong. And you could cite the sixth commandment if you were a religious person. You could say, uh, Thou shall not murder. This law is higher, a higher law that tells me I cannot shoot anybody. I cannot go out there and kill. Uh, so as a Christian, I cannot in good conscience go to war. And there were many, many young men who, who tried to get out of the war, tried to get out of the draft at that time. And many, if they could not get out of it, they, they left the U.S. to go to Canada to find safety and a haven there. Um, interesting. You know, uh, but there were many that got out of fighting because of that, that they felt in their heart it was wrong, and they did not choose to go. Every day now we have decisions to make. Do we render unto Caesar, that is, unto Washington, or are we rendering unto God and heaven? Two sides, two decisions. These are hard decisions sometimes, and, and do we dare pray? What would Jesus do in this situation? What would Jesus do? I was watching a documentary uh, on WNED, PBS, and it was, uh, it was called Driving in Cars While Black. And it was talking about the, the power of mobility and transportation and how always uh, in our nation there have been rules and regulations that restricted some groups of people from travel. And then the automobile kind of opened the pathway for traveling. Um, and it's talking really about the Jim Crow era. Jim Crow laws were designed to keep blacks and white people separated. And it was really a powerful documentary. In fact, I, I, I'd like to show it and discuss it with a group of people. So I, I am going to try to arrange that to happen. But the important thing was in this uh, following up on George Floyd's death, you know, here was a, a African American man who uh, had really not done anything terribly wrong, and yet the police came. They dictated to him how he was to act. They ended up killing him. And there have been other situations where that happened. And anybody who is black and driving may get stopped at any time just for being black. And it, it, it bumps up a level of fear and a level of antagonism uh, towards the police and towards the brutality that they have been living with for basically 400 years. You know, ever since the slaves were brought over uh, to this country to work here, uh, there have been complications and diver you know, diversity and, and divisiveness because of that. And so, is the nation right or wrong? Those Jim Crow laws, were they right or wrong? I think they were wrong. And according to God's way of looking at it, I think they were wrong. And so, in good conscience, could you abide by that? Um, it was a very interesting documentary. But in closing today, I, I want to relate a story from Rod, uh, Father Richard Rohr. R-O-H-R -R is how his last name is spelled. He's a Catholic priest who founded the Center for Action and Contemplation. And he writes in his book, Falling Upward, A Spirituality for the Two Halves of Life. He says, I recently watched a documentary on the life of the blind and deaf woman, Helen Keller. She seems to have leaped into the second half of life in the chronological first half of her life, once she discovered her depths and despite her severe limitations. She lived an entire life of rather amazing happiness and generativity for others. She was convinced that life was about service to others and not about protecting or lamenting her supposedly handicapped body. That seems to be the greatest difference between transformed and non-transformed people. Great people come to serve, not to be served. It is the twelfth and final necessary step of the inspired twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Until and unless you give your life away to others, you do not seem to have it yourself, 
at any deep level. Um, so think about that. Greatest difference between transformed and non-transformed people. Great people come to serve, not to be served. So the crux of the matter today is this. You know, we cannot fool or trick God. God knows our hearts. He knows our motivations. He sees us clearly with no filter. Jesus knows you. He loves you. He cares about you. He is eager that we follow him and become his disciple. As we age, we are called to greater wisdom, to rest in God's promises, and to trust God's design for our life, God's purpose for our life. He calls us all to choose this day whom shall we serve. Will you serve him and choose to serve others? Will you let God transform you? Final question is, whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? I'm reminded of Joshua in the Old Testament who, when he was pressed to make a decision, he said for everybody to, to hear, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And I'm calling you out. Will you let God transform you? Whose side are you on? Uh, would you pray with me this morning? Oh God, God, Lord of life, Lord of light, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this life that you've given to us, how precious it is. Thank you for the breath that we can breathe. Thank you for the time we have on this earth, short though it is. God, we pray for, for forgiveness for the, for the times we have been selfish and self-serving. And we, we ask for forgiveness. I ask for forgiveness for times that we have been divisive instead of uniting. When we have been uh, prejudiced, instead of not seeing color, we have seen color and skin tone. God, we pray that you would make us colorblind. I pray that you would make us a nation united by your love and by purpose, divine purpose. To be a nation under God, one nation, uh, pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct us. Pray that you would guide our hearts, that you would open us to transformation from the inside out. And we ask and pray all these things in the name of God our Father, Christ uh, the Messiah, Christ the Holy One of Israel, and in the name and power of the Holy Spirit, in your presence, God, the Advocate, the Paraclete. Amen. Well, maybe this sermon or message inspired you, and I hope it did. I hope God continues to work in your heart uh, and calls you to service, service for others, service uh, in the greater community, service in your family, service in ways that you maybe have not ever imagined, uh, because it is in service that often we find our identity and we find really uh, a calling and a mission for our life. Um, I want to encourage you to be a generous person, uh, generous people, and, and the reason I'm generous and, and I don't mind saying it is because God has blessed me in so many ways. And if I tried to think of all the ways God has blessed me, it's overwhelming. So just think of one or two things that you uh, have been blessed by God. You know, maybe you have talent or skill. Maybe you have a job that, that really is a blessing. Maybe you have a house that is a blessing to you or an apartment. Um, how about family members? You have some family that is a blessing to you. Everything, everything that we count as a blessing is truly a gift from God, a gift from God's hand to us. Um, as soon as you start to see things that way, and you see that we are just stewards of this planet and the things that God has given us, uh, you start to look at life differently. Uh, you really do. And uh, of course, the, you know, the Old Testament, they, they say a tithe, that was 10%. Um, to give 10% of your income or 10% of the produce or 10% of your blessings back to God. And that's, that's really just a starting point. Um, I tell everybody, 
if you start by tithing, giving 10%, and you don't have to start at 10%, start at 5% of your income. If you just start giving that, give faithfully the 10%, God will bless the remaining 90% beyond your expectations, beyond belief, really. Um, there's a way of multiplying in the kingdom of God that it doesn't have to make sense, but God will bless you, trust me. Uh, if you have been generous and you've been giving right along, I thank you. I, I thank you so much. It means a lot. Um, and if you have not been giving, I encourage you to start trying to give. You know, just start giving a little bit. Uh, give 1%, 2%, 3%. Um, and it's up to you how you calculate that out. But <clears throat> if you want to give, you can mail in a gift to the Lakewood United Methodist Church, uh, 146 um, Shadyside Avenue, Lakewood, New York, 14750. Or if you're with Celeron's congregation, it's Box 477, Celeron, New York, 14720. And I thank you in advance for your generosity, for your giving. Um, normally I would say a prayer, and I, I'm going to do that. Let's pray over gifts and giftedness. God, we thank you for the blessings you do give and that every good and perfect gift is from your hand. We ask that you would bless these gifts, multiply them, and in surprising ways, multiply them for the good of the work of the church and the kingdom of God. And we pray and ask all this in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, the doxology is, is really a, a, a hymn of thanksgiving. And I love to sing it. Would you sing it with me if you know it? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, our final song, our final hymn of the morning, is number 157 in your red hymnal, your Methodist hymnal. Jesus shall reign, number 157. Now I'm going to click on my computer link. Please sing, sing with me. Jesus shall reign where the sun does its successive journeys run. His kingdom spread from shore to shore Till moon shall wax and wane no more To Jesus endless prayers be made And endless praises crown His head his name like sweet perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice. People and realms of every tongue dwell on his love with sweetest song. And infant voices shall proclaim Their early blessings on His name Blessings abound where'er He reigns All prisoners leap and loose their chains the weary find eternal rest, and all who suffer want are blessed. Let every creature rise.
praise and bring honors peculiar to our King. Angels descend with songs again, and earth repeat the loud Amen. I love these hymns. You know, most of these hymns tell a story. Um, some of the more modern songs don't tell the same kind of story. They're, they're certainly songs of adoration, songs of praise. But some of these old hymns really tell a story. And if you listen to the story, it tells the gospel message. You know, how Christ came and Christ lived and died and rose again and lives eternally and brings forgiveness forever for you and for me and he gives us eternal life forever for you and for me um, and all we have to do is receive it uh, his grace is sufficient for us even in whatever condition we're in you know whatever condition you're in bring yourself to God and God will bring his grace to you um, this is our uh, unison benediction <clears throat> for the morning. O oh God of all time and space, allow us space and time this week to serve you well. We go to honor your name and share your way to all people. In God we pray, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Amen. I say amen to you and I say shalom to you. God bless your day. God bless the week ahead, and I pray that you have been uplifted and encouraged and uh, called, called in your heart to serve in some fashion, in some way. Um, you know, and if you, if you ever, ever want to talk uh, with me personally, you can do that. You can call the church office, set up an appointment. Uh, you can contact me on Facebook. You can contact me on my email, pastormike60 at hotmail.com. Uh, or you can call my home number, 386-5345. I'd love to talk with you, uh, encourage you, uh, help you if I can, and certainly turn you to Christ, who is our help in every circumstance. So, blessings on your day, my friends.